Now, you all do know this isn't about swarm in the engine, right? Okay, good. <laughs> Didn't think it would be this crowded. So, All right, um, immutable awesomeness where containers collide with software supply chains. Josh Corman can't be here. So for those people who are huge Josh Corman fans, I will tell you why he's not going to be here in a little bit, and it's pretty awesome why he's not going to be here. So This is DockerCon, right? Okay, good. So are you ready to be immutably awesome? Anybody? No? Yeah. There you go. All right, so I'm Bachgaloop. I um, uh, Twitter, that is actually Dr. Deming. That's not me. Um, the, I've been 35 years. I started Exxon. I was actually one of early cloud evangelists for Canonical before they even had OpenStack. Um, and uh, I, I, I talked to Jonathan Bryce today. He's here. You know, and I, I actually run my blog still on Maso, which is what he created when he was at Rackspace. Um, I was actually the ninth person at Chef, um, and I thought that was pretty amazing, and I thought it was the most amazing growth thing I've ever seen until I got to Docker. Um, the start, I've had like 10 startups. Uh, startup guards have been very good to me in the last uh, five years. I was involved as a principal of a company we sold to Dell, called Stratius. About a year and a half ago, I had this crazy idea of putting SDN and marrying it with Docker. I guess the Docker folk liked it, so they acquired our, my company. Madhu Vengapali and a bunch of other folks. I'm actually, my day job is Director of Ecosystem Development at Docker, which really is a fancy name for BD. Um, I am a DevOps Day core organizer. I, am the, I was the only American at the first DevOps Days in Ghent six years ago. Um, I do this podcast with my good friend, Damon Edwards. I'm also, how many people have heard of the, the DevOps Enterprise Summit? Ooh, not as many as I'd hoped, okay. Um, it's with Gene Kim. How many people heard of Gene Kim? Ah, that's better. Okay. Well, he, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conference for DevOps and enterprise-only stories. Um, so with that, I, I just wanted to give you kind of the frame of DevOps, right? Because a lot of this, you know, we talk about immutable instruction, especially supply chain, it, it, it kind of translates into this thing we call DevOps. I've been very passionate and involved in it for many years. I would say DevOps is a movement uh, motivated to turn human capital into high-performance organizational capital. Um, I'm actually, next week, we're going to release a book that we've been working on for eight years with Jez Humble, Gene Kim, Patrick Barr, and myself, called DevOps Handbook. Um, and uh, we're going to give out copies at DevOps Enterprise Summit London. Um, but uh, you can order it, but I don't think it's available to probably September. Uh, Josh can't be here. So me and Josh, and I'm going to tell you how we met and why this presentation became relevant. But Josh is like... I, He's my hero. Um, but, and he was working at Sonotype, but he actually, uh, as his kind of side job, he created something called the I Am the Cavalry. And what I Am the Cavalry does is they actually go in. Remember that Jeep that they ran off the side of the road? That was I Am the Cavalry. They actually do um, white hat hacking on devices that potentially could kill somebody if they hacking. They actually got the FDA to pull um, uh, an insulin pump, a Bluetooth insulin pump. So, he decided to quit his day job and do that full time. In other words, he tries to save lives and is saving your lives. Um, so this week, the reason he can't be here is he's actually speaking to Congress, trying to make sure they understand that white hat hackers are a good thing with all this IoT stuff coming down the pike. OK? Yeah, he's awesome. Imagine that. He gets a clap, and he's not even here. That's pretty cool. Um, so anyway, but we did this together, and we've collaborated. And so, all right, so let's start with what motivates you, right? If I give you a gold star, is that, like, awesome? That's all he needs. There he is. Uh, money, you know, carrots. Well, for me, it's, it's passion. It's always been passion. Um, you know, and, and you know, I, I think, you know, before I got into this DevOps thing, I actually did lots of years of large proprietary infrastructure, and I always felt like I wasn't solving any real problems. And then... You know, then I got this DevOps thing, and I got really excited. And then when I stumbled on this Docker things, I, I got even more excited, right? Like, that stuff this morning was off the chart cool, right? No doubt. I thought it was. <laughs> so the problem with people's passion <laughs> is when they poop, it may look awesome, but it's still poop. And so Pete Cheslock did this a while back, right? Like, you know, we got to be careful about our passion, because the people who have to scoop that crap up, right, 
um, you know, they don't necessarily see it in the same light, right? And so, um, so what happened here is Josh and I collided at DevOps Day Austin. Um, it was last year, beginning of last year. He did a presentation on supply chain, uh, and I did a presentation on immutable infrastructure, immutable delivery. And we both realized that we both were missing an ingredient. I mean, I was about like, how do we build stuff? I may cuss once in a while, so, but um, I, 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 build, I like things that go fast and build fast. Adrian Krakow's in the room. That was, but he says faster, cheaper, safer, right? It's a great presentation. Um, what Josh was saying is, um, you know, that the, the, like, we need to think about how we deliver things. So we had this long conversation. And we decided to do a presentation at DevOps Enterprise Summit last year. Uh, by the way, Josh was one of the founders of Devo Rugged DevOps, which is like putting, um, putting um, security in the, in the CI pipeline, CD pipeline, right? It's about um, doing kind of things like Selenium or Cucumber for security stuff. It's like really awesome stuff, right? And it's a bigger pitch than that. Um, the thing is, Gene Kim, who wrote the Phoenix Project, is um, he has these tribes. And I was in one of the tribe, and Josh was another tribe. And fortunately, um, Gene introduced us. We basically got this idea. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of Josh's part of the presentation. So Josh says that when we see, when we all see, most of us see software as eating the world, he sees software as infecting the world. Right? Uh, because in a, um, a, a modern car now, supposedly it's 10 million lines of code. And we know that like, coders aren't perfect, sorry. There are defects. And so as these things start spreading out all around our life and everything, right, we start you know, thinking about you know, what is the effect of all this. Like We're going fast. We're doing amazing things in IT in our industry. And so take, for example, Heartbleed. Now, I will put my perspective here. I've been an operations junkie my whole life. I love operational infrastructure. When I think about Heartbleed, I think about all the context switch, unplanned outages. Like, like that was, you know, the glaring effect to me of that, like, we basically, uh, you know, across globally, got this, you know, in DevOps, we like to think about pipelines and efficiencies and, you know, and as I said, you, you know, turning human capital into high performance organizations. Um, you know, so, you know, Heartbleed would just, you know, took us off course. And, and so Josh talks about this, um, you know, using kind of uh, a meta example for what we can think about infrastructure, right? So there was the uh, earthquake in Haiti. It was a 7.0 and 230,000 people died. Six weeks later in Chile, it was an 8.8 and 279 people died. Anybody want to give me a short explanation of why that Well, it's actually primarily building codes, right? Like, Chile had pretty strict or medium to strict building codes, and, and Haiti didn't. And so the question that we got to ask when we're going faster, cheaper, safer is, are we addressing our building codes? And so I will tell you everything goes back to Dr. Deming, but that would be another hour presentation. Um, but, but Deming said it's, it's not enough to do your best. You must know what to do and then do your best. Like, in other words, going fast in the wrong direction right, is the wrong direction. So this is something else Josh pointed out. There was a, a poll that was done on the OpenSSL um, floor, and it was 110 days, 110 vendors. And not to pick on any vendor here, but... Like, this was unplanned outage for everybody, right? All the customers who had to put patches in. Like, as Josh says, imagine what the global GDP was of that one incident, that one floor. Right? Technical debt. Right? So, you know, and we talk about in DevOps, we talk about technical, you know, I mean, we talk about it in development. I've been thinking about this for at least 10 years in terms of operational infrastructure. And so we start thinking about, so here's the thing, open source is awesome. We get, there's, there's the beauty in what we get from open source. 
but it comes with a price. And it's part of our life. So um, Verizon does this report you know, every year. And in 2015, um, they basically did this report. And so basically, 97% of all the exploits from their survey were due to 10 CVEs. Right? These are vulnerabilities defined by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Anybody want to see something interesting on there? What? But, right, eight of them were over 10 years old. So like Josh says, you know, we, we, you know, in 60 minutes we'll do anything about exotic exploits and espionage and all that, right? But 97% of everything that got exploited that year before was like 10-year-old known vulnerabilities. So the question is, like, raw innovation at, at any cost or net innovation? Right? So, um, you know, the, the kind of abilities, you know, manageability, you know, repeatability, you know, are we, you know, are we considering net innovation when we do things? And so, you know, if we go back to Deming, you know, the reason I am so interested in Deming is if you want to reverse track DevOps, I'll tell you the short history right now. DevOps comes from Lean and Agile. Lean primarily comes from Toyota production systems. Toyota was a company for, what, 50 years decimated the American car makers beyond repair. Toyota production systems, their, their Shakespeare, if you will, of quality was Dr. Deming. So, there's an interesting book, and this is the one that um, Josh introduced me. It's called uh, Toyota Supply Chain Management. And it talks about these supply chain principles that I'm going to show you that we can drive that in the net innovation story. And so part of this book compares the Prius to the vault. Right? And the, the, um, here's some of the metrics. The, um, the Prius was 61% cheaper than the vault. So 13 times more than, than the Volt. But here's the thing. Their in-house production was 50% less. Right? And then this, and take note, they had 16% fewer suppliers. So you know, if we think about Deming's influence, Toyota Proxy System, Volt, Prius versus Volt, there were a couple of principles that come out of supply chain from manufacturing. Fewer suppliers, higher quality parts, and track which parts are using where and when and how. So let's take healthcare.gov. I was told that there were 11 Java framework, logging frameworks. How many crypto libraries are you supporting in your organization? How many web frameworks? What Deming said is narrow down on your suppliers. And I don't work for Google, and I imagine some people here do here, but I've been told that there are very limited list of different frameworks. They don't have 11 logging frameworks, at least I've been told. Or well, I know that high-performing organizations don't. And when we think about um, the uh, used high-quality parts, right? That's our CI/CD, our fresh deploys, our in the things we get in. That becomes fresh. We get quality, small batch. What we haven't done really well is kind of build a material provenance of where we come from. How do we, you know, if we're deploying any software, but now containers, how do we know what's the meta in there that gets us this kind of how we can track all the way back? So although Josh couldn't be here, I'm actually going to go ahead and run a demo or a video of something awesome that he did. So, if software is eating the world, here is a piece of software. Okay. You turn that now, off. this piece of software is not monolithic. We don't write our own software anymore. While we weren't paying attention, 90% of a modern application is assembled from third-party parts. Now, I asked several people throughout the conference, how many individual third-party open source components do you have in an average product? Most of you said about 50. And I think that's probably a good guess, because you probably chose 50. But our study of several thousand applications proves there's about 106 unique components 
in a modern application because when you choose something like struts, it chooses more downstream dependencies. Now, after Heartbleed, we know that it's not going to be all green, healthy ingredients that go into our food. Some of them have vulnerabilities. The industry average is about 23% of those components we pick have a known vulnerability that was entirely avoidable. There was a bad version, and there's a good version sitting right next to it. We just didn't know or care to look. This is elective risk, elective complexity. And even if you don't care about security, each one of these red circles represents the opportunity for unplanned, unscheduled work, lost productivity, and an opportunity to be more productive and more innovative. Now, I wish that hackers were the only threat, but we also know about lawyers. So if you understand what happened with uh, Cisco and the Linux Foundation and Free Software Foundation, you know, they paid out several hundred million dollars in penalties for using GPLA and copy left. So these yellow ones are also, 8% of them have some sort of dangerous or restrictive license. And I personally felt the pain when I was acquired by IBM, we had to kill two products because we were using a borderline license. And I had to kiss good goodbye two babies of ours out of our portfolio that we had spent years working on because it was just too hard to back out that dependency on that bad license. So if this is the thing, what I want to call out is, let's say only 10% of those even manifest a year, right? So there's, that's going to be two times a year I have to replace something like a Heartbleed or a bad Apache Struts 2 maybe $100 each. So what we're talking about is not super hard at the individual app level. It's maybe two components out of 24, maybe 20 hours to fix it, 2,000 bucks, right? But here's the thing, none of you have an app. You're probably touching 10. Your division's probably touching 100. And now what are we starting to add up to? We're looking at a quarter of a million dollars in wasted payroll. And we're looking more importantly at unplanned, unscheduled work that could have been delivering new features to your customers or new value to market. And these are small numbers. I asked one of these presenters earlier this week, how many are you working on? And he said, Josh, I have 2,500 2, apps and 106 each. We are talking about $6 million and uh, 60,000 hours of unproductive work, right? So if this is the food that we're serving, at scale, many of you also have some sort of refrigerator you're storing your ingredients in. So let's say you've got some sort of code repository. It's got 300 projects in it. Each of them might have 15 versions of those 300 projects. We actually had one person using 81 versions of Spring in production. Think of the maintainability, sustainability, quality, help desk calls, break fixes, lost revenue on e-commerce from maintaining 81 concurrent versions of a dead project. And the thing is, of those ingredients in our refrigerator, most of them have gone spoiled or rotten. They're either buggy or less functional or have vulnerabilities. So let's say 70% of those are rotten. So this one piece of food that we serve is sourced from a subset of those. And if we can take Deming's principles of fewer and better suppliers, do I need to support every logging framework, every web framework, every crypto library? Can I consolidate like Google has down to one supported version of a library, maybe two in production? And does that translate into savings? And at least for one executive, he told his board of the $1.5 billion we spend on software every year and 2,000 developers, if I start saying an invest list of projects and a divest list of projects, in one calendar year, we'll get a 15% boost in developer productivity. By the end of the calendar year, we're doing nothing more than an invest list of projects and a divest list of projects to get at the heart of the software supply chain, he got a 30% boost in developer productivity. So not only is it the safe thing to do when software is eating the world, it's also the most economic thing to do. So can we switch to slides, please? And if you're wondering about, well, Josh, that only handles the known vulnerabilities, uh, one of the data scientists. So we did that, right? Um, I was going to, I want to make sure I don't run out of time, but there's a section there where I'm actually standing on the side of the stage. So if you do a Google DOS, it's basically this presentation, but if you Google DOES 15, Willis and Corman, that whole time he's branding, I'm just holding a bag. And the guy who did the back thing, he was freaking out because he didn't know what I was doing. And so as soon as Josh finished, he took chocolate bars and he threw them out to the audience. And he said, how many people love chocolate? And everybody went, yeah, of course. And I opened up the bag and I pulled out a jar of peanut butter. Right? And, and so that, you know, our, our metaphorical, you know, supply chain and immutable infrastructure, which is I'm going to cover right now, is that kind of chocolate and peanut butter. And I will tell you this. Um, if you like this presentation and you agree with it, 
Boy, I didn't think the room was going to be this big. I might have to buy like 10 Cheesecake Factory peanut butter and chocolate pies, but follow me after the last presentation, and I'll buy it. So immutability, really small pieces. Um, <laughs> This is good for me, right? Um, immutability, right? All right, so here's the thing, right? So now I'm going to get into this kind of immutability discussion, right? And so back in, what, 2011, Netflix kind of freaked everybody out. They said, you know, we they did article, this blog article about building infrastructure in Legos. It was a really good article. And if you go back, when I read it, I was working at Chef at the time, and I was like, and part of it was like, we don't use Chef and Puppet. Like, you guys out of your mind? You have to use Chef and Puppet. Golden images, image pro, it'll be the worst thing ever. But then you go back and read it later, and you see that, you know, why, would, why wouldn't we treat AMIs like we treat WAR files? Why wouldn't we create AMIs that are complete infrastructure, check them into some artifact repository, and then when we deploy, pull them just like we do that? Love it. Work really well. Um, Keith Morris also wrote, um, you know, immutable server. So there's this concept, like, really boiling about um, immutable infrastructure, and I will say this, this is when all of my computer science slash uh, physics professor folk get mad at me. There is no such thing as an immutable server. The minute you power it on, it changes. I use this term as a pattern. All right? I'm not naive to think that there is such thing as immutability. Um, so with that, there is a great paper that uh, was written in 2002 by Steve Trugat. So before Luke Kinnis and Adam Jacob and all the cool kids that written Chef Puppet, and um, there were a couple of people that were really thinking about configuration management. Mark Burgess, who wrote CF Engine, invented the genre of infrastructure as code, convergence, uh, desired state, and Steve Trugat. Trugat wrote a paper, you know, why order matters. And what was interesting, when I was at Chef, uh, one of the ways that I would basically, from a sales perspective, destroy Puppet was I would bring out this paper because at the time, and this has changed, Puppet used a dependency graph to build infrastructure. So depending on the scale, 100 servers, who cared? 1,000 servers, maybe 3,000, 4,000 servers. The order of how you built things did matter. It created these incredible weird edge cases, which were the hardest bugs to, to fix. Now, eventually, Puppet created an order of infrastructure as well, so they're both kind of even now. Um, but this turned out there's a great job of kind of explaining in very detail, which is very relevant today, of why order matters. And what he described in that paper is uh, really three models, one divergent, convergent, and congruent. So divergent is, in general, not managed. How many of you heard people have heard of Knight Capital? Night, all right, so Knight Capital, look it up. It's an amazing story, SEC filing on it. This is a company that was basically running a divergent pattern. Um, they didn't use infrastructure code. They didn't rebuild servers. Um, they lost $400 million in 45 minutes and were out of business in 24 hours. And they were the high, second largest high frequency trading company on the NYSC. Right? And, and if you read the SEC report, like from a junkie uh, from operations, you're like, oh my god, this is amazing. They didn't, you know. In fact, what happened was they repurposed a flag. Uh, an administrator forgot to manually rebuild the eighth of a seven server cluster. That repurposed flag actually flipped on a, uh, a non production trading algorithm, and the rest was history for them. Uh, convergence is really our kind of infrastructure's mode. Desired state, we continually converge. It works really good, but we have to set some cycle and we'll keep and converge. And then congruence is, you know, I, I talked to Mark Burgess about this paper when I first got it and he said that. It was weird, because uh, Trugat was basically way ahead of his time. Like, this is what immutable infrastructure gives us. There's a truly congruent architecture, and this paper will make a much harder argument than I could ever make of why that model is best. Um, and, and so I won't bore you with too many things, but like circular dependencies, if you're updating the thing that actually manages this, the update of the software, um, you know, the truth of the matter is most of the things you find in in, in infrastructure's code or scripts. So it was amazing when you look about this master stuff and how we should always get away from bash or shell, and then you know, a third of the primitives in the recipes are call-outs to bash, right? Um, and, and so the, the, the question is, like, if the wrong order or something silently solves when the next thing comes up, 
Uh, same thing with packages. And so what I'm getting at is, imagine your world where in your laptop, you infrastructure's code build it. And it has all those kind of possible convergent properties. Then you build it the same way in your CI, and then you do the same thing in production. At scale, you're, you're questionably adding some variance where um, you're not congruent and could cause problems. Um, I'll, I'll go through this quick, but our, our good, our awesome Jerome Pazani does a real simple thing. Here's the thing, right? The thing that we, and I'm not going anti Schaffer puppet here, I just want you to understand the model. You know, here's a good example where it says, it, it, this is a puppet, not picking up puppet, the package ensure uh, open SSL installed. I decided I need to upgrade a version, great. I realized I need to. Um, Roll back. Well, guess what, folks? For the most part, infrastructure's code products, they don't keep backup copies of configs and packages. When they say item potency, what they're really saying is checksums. Right? And so you try to go back and you, know, you think you're going back to the previous version. No, you're going back to the version that was put in before that. You know, in Immutable, um, people talk about. Um, no CRUD allowed. So beyond, when it gets past the laptop, like you cannot change a package, a configuration file, an application. You know, in databases, there's some nice models there because it's it's hard to be immutable for database. But the, the, some of the models are you just um, I say I say called no RUD, right? Or RUD, right? Which is you um, you you create records, but you just never delete them or update them. You know, and in one of the arguments, like, I get, like, oh, this immutable thing, I'm sure, how do you do it? And then I thought about, like, kind of a Java object, right? What do you do with Java? You don't change the object, you change the point of the object. Well, that's what we do here with servers, right? Um, we provision a server, we test it, then we change the pointer to that server. Um, I think there's a history here. I'm, I'm going to skip this a little bit, but we've been battling this thing in, as an industry. You know, anybody who's old enough to remember golden images and ghost? And you had image sprawl, and then VDI was an answer. Then you had VM, and then you had kind of um, your infrastructure as code. And then there was always this argument or debate over bake versus fry. You know, do you um, do you bake? In other words, you start with just enough operating system and build all the way up. There's a cost to that. It's certainly a time to deliver. There's a cost. Do you just fry? Like, is it already frozen? And you throw it in the pan. And then we got containers. And so when I got to Docker. I remembered Steve Trugat's paper, and I was asked to um, write some, I'm a DevOps guy, right? So, hey, write an article about Docker's new really cool um, thing about how to use Docker for, for kind of delivery and continuous integration. And it's a great paper. So I went ahead, and I've been working with Gene, and Gene has something called the three ways of DevOps. You know, um, flow, left to right, accelerating flow, how we deliver stuff. Um, Feedback, second right to left, amplifying feedback loops. Um, and then the third way is a continuous experimentation and learning. And so I really went through and I kind of built a white paper. It was three blog articles, but a white paper on how Docker fits this model so well. I wrote another article at the end of the year called Immutable Delivery. So I kind of coined this immutable delivery idea because immutable infrastructure was really cool because you were talking about starting an infrastructure. And I started to realize that now we're talking about bringing it all the way back to the laptop. And in a microservices world, right, imagine everything I do, I develop my little service. Um, I pull in the five or six other services that I might test with. And the fact that I can do it all on one VM is kind of cool. <laughs> I don't have to start up 10 VMs on my laptop. right? And then, But all those other ones are mutable from some artifact reader version. I test mine. When I'm done with mine, I go through kind of a, a local CI process and build. But when I test mine, I, I push mine down the pipeline. And when it gets to the other pipeline, the next stage in the pipe, like integration, it's bit for bit immutable. And best what? The other services that get pulled to test against are the same exact bit for bits that I tested against. And then when it moves on, if it goes green, it goes to production, then I've, had, I've got this immutable image or binary that's in production that is for the most part, identical. Again, the ho Docker host, there are some, there's some variants. But in general, and in, De and, and in DevOps, we say that developers should wear pagers. So imagine you're the developer, you're a pager, and you're pretty certain. I mean, you're, you're kind of mean time to detect whether it's an infrastructure problem 
or it's, um, it's your code problem. It gets shortened. You know, and you hear people talk about this over and over and over. And so if we go back to, this is one of my favorite DevOps uh, uh, pictures. It's like Damien Edwards, my co-host DevOps. Is this idea of, like, if you think about the first way we talk about in DevOps, the aha to ka-ching. And how do you get from kind of an idea to some delivery of service that actually makes money? And in DevOps, we used to talk about there's a wall of confusion, right? The old days, developers stood over the wall, operations caught it, blame, you guys broke it. No, you implemented it wrong. And so we talked a lot about how do we destroy that wall of confusion, how do we get speed, and what we're really looking at getting is shorted lead time. Because lead time is a metric that tells you how good you are. In fact, there's a DevOps survey run by Poppet Labs and Gene Kim, and it is statistically done by a PhD da data scientist, uh, statistician, psychometric expert, and it's the, it's, we, it's, um, this is the sixth year. Um, 20,000 people have done surveys. On the last one, the difference between a high-performing and low-performing organization is that high-performing organizations correlate these four, three, four variables together. They deploy more often. Now, this is sound data. This stuff we've known in DevOps forever. Now we have data to prove it. They deploy more often, and their lead time is shorter. Right? And that means they're faster than low-performing organizations. But here's the killer they all also have better resilience. Because the other two variables are their chain success rate is better than low performing. So they can go faster and be better, and their MTTR, mean time to resolve, is shorter than low performing organizations. We got data that proves this out. Right, so how do you get to that kind of speed? So to tie back um, Josh's, the Toyota uh, supply chain management, uh, they t we talk about the four Vs. Um, Variety, velocity, variability, and visibility. In variety, you know, in Toyota, so how do we apply this to us, right? Like lean is a big part of this. Eric Reese's lean startup. Like this question of to market and operational cost. You know, and we've learned things like MVP, pivot, build, measure, learn, customer develop methodology, right? These are things that, that help us balance that how much should we spend on the technology versus how much should we find out whether the technology is going to be adopted. Velocity, I think I've gone through this, right? Now imagine, I mean, most of you know this, right? I'm preaching to the choir here, right? Like, I remember doing my DevOps Cafe podcast early on, and, and people would tell me that development managers say their developers get furious when they have to build a conversion infrastructure on their laptop that takes more than about 40 seconds. Right? Why? Because containers. Like, try that with VMs. Try converging VMs. You know, average one to two minute startup time. And you get the, you know, you all probably know the value add of, of containers in the CI. In web scale mode, it's kind of lingua franca to use Docker in the CI process. Um, jury's out on Docker and Docker, but I mean, the, the efficiencies that you can get by running containers or containerizing your kind of integration uh, process. One of the earliest killer stories in Docker was the, um, was the, 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 the first blog I ever read of when, when Docker first came out was this company that actually did this horizontal scale of a single state of a Postgres table, and they were able to test it over a thousand times to kind of rebase back to the state. Imagine you had to do that with VMs, right? Like, it could take five days. This model took an hour, an hour and a half. Um, so, and then the deployment, like, so if you think, if you've heard of blue-green deploys, like, Imagine you can deploy a whole cluster in 60 seconds. So IBM did this thing a couple of years ago where they, they did this, um, where they started 150 containers running Apache with just a splash screen. And they did it serially, and it took like 130 seconds to create, in order. The destroy time was nine seconds. And then variation, as I alluded to this early, imagine that you, in every step of the process, you don't have to worry about these edge variants of the repository when you did the package wasn't available, or this silently died. Imagine that you can get rid of all that variance. You know, it, it, um, one of the cool things, um, going back to Toyota, when the, um, uh, early on, when American car makers realized they were getting destroyed by Toyota, they asked if they could go visit the Toyota plants. 
And Toyota was so confident in what they did, uh, they let him come. And there was a great story about one or two of the engineers from like Ford or some were watching the guy who puts the door in. And after about 20 minutes, they asked him, hey, how come you don't use a rubber mallet to fit that door? And, and, and the Japanese worked like, well, what are you talking about? No, no, you know that rubber thing, you gotta bang it and you gotta like fit it in, bang, bang, bang. And then finally, after like 15 minutes of like scratching his head, he's like, oh, 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 I know what you're talking about. That never happens. Like that's mathematically, statistically solved way down there. The door's gonna fit. Um, you know, an invisibility, um, you know, when we start, you know, and, and I'm not talking about something that visualizes containers. I'm talking when you start thinking about, like, bounded context and, and microservices and now, in general, the context of the services that you deliver are in a visible form from, like, I know if you've followed any of the kind of SOA to domain-driven and now what we call microservices, right? Like, like, there becomes an inherent visibility in that model of how we start, and is, people say, is microservice mandates containers or does containers, no. But the two go together really well. And so um, Ari Paneer, who's another DevOps person, did this great blog article, I have a link to it in that, Three Ways of DevOps, but we just started running Docker containers very early, and he realized he was just gonna put tons of metadata in them. Who built it? Why they built it? Where'd it go? Where's the repository? All this stuff. And then he shipped in every container a little container.sh command that basically could tell him anything he wants. So, so let's think about supply chain again. How do we do a recall when open SSL hits or a floor happens? How do we know where everything is? How many frameworks do we have to deal with? Well, supply chain talks about building materials. Um, you know, there's so many things we've done with Docker are pretty awesome now with trust and, and security scanning. But in general, like immutability is awesome. Immutable infrastructure, I, I love it, the idea, and developers seem to love it too. But we need to make sure that we're getting the right meta and being able to track back, even operationally, let alone what Josh was talking about, lawsuits and, and providence and all that. And so um, two years ago, Michael Breswick did this, um, from Gilt, did this presentation. Gilt has been a poster child for immutable uh, from microservices, and I love it, you know, it's at, um, I'm such a geek, at 2804, he already talks about how awesome Docker is. Like, he's gone on and on about how they tried this, they tried that, they tried that, and Docker's so awesome. And he talks about, like, all we do here is developers had this meta file. And this is, you know, I won't read all of it, but he says, I'll start here, he says, this is kind of amazing. He says, any EC2 instance that we spin up, we don't care if we're running Node, Ruby, Scala, Java, or even if you made up your own programming language, um, you know, they, that, like, he said that they basically just supply this meta definition. And he said that, you know, before we did this of kind of a mutable infrastructure, what I would call mutable delivery, we had, um, we, had, um, a th we had one big repository for all our scripts on how to build. And I would say that some of the people who wrote the scripts were dead, some of the people had moved on. So, right, you all know the release engineering scripts. Right, and then there were 1,000 um, Git repos, 300 different applications, seven-year-old, 25 different ways to do software guilt. And that was DevOps, right? And I would say that like, I would call this the wasteland between DevOps, even where the company had thought they were already running DevOps patterns. So, these chocolate bagels with bacon. <laughs> That's what it is, folks. Um, all right, this is my ending slide. I'm like, one minute. This is awesome. Um, so Josh talks about, unfortunately, we, can't, we haven't been able to get this person to, um, to publicly create this, but one of Josh's like, most, um, he, he says he's the best application security person he ever knows, ever met. Um, he basically tracks this, um, how many security, um, uh, critical and high security defect rate per 10,000 lines of code. His personal best was, um, was six. When he went into company, they had 10. When they took some of the basic hygiene, never, no first order principles, but some of the basic hygiene of supply chain, they got it down to four defects per 10,000 lines of code. Right? Then they applied the um, fewer suppliers model. They got it down to one 
defect per 10,000. So this is a top world-class app security person, well-known RSA, working at one of the top five insurance companies in the world. When they applied the supply chain and Docker immutable delivery model, they got it down to 0.01 defects per 10,000 lines of code. Like, this is real. Two orders of magnitude when they started. Docker has some things that we're, you know, we're not deaf here, right? Uh, tr trust, scanning, right? These are tools that we should absolutely apply, but we should think about meta, we need supply chain. I would definitely look in the supply chain. I think you're probably all sold on immutable infrastructure. Um, you know, what's your gold star? Um, thank you very much. Okay, so we've got time for a couple of questions. Who wants to go first? We got somebody over here. Yes. Uh, hi, yes. I'm a big fan of immutable infrastructure, but there's always a trade off, like a cost. Um, are we not talking about the cost of, of the size, of how many images we keep around, or the complexity to manage that full audit trail? There always is. You know, a good friend of mine, Chris Brown, wrote EC2. He says, there's a balloon. You squeeze the balloon, the action moves over here, right? Um, everything comes at a cost. Um, I think overall, these models for visibility, variation, and whatnot, um, there's plenty being discussed about the complexity of microservices in general, right? Which, if you tie that immutability, right? How we manage that, yes. I, I do think the jury's out a little bit on this model is better than the old model in general, but you know, you, your point is well taken. It's, it's not, nothing is, um, you know, magic, right? 